And good morning to everybody uh, watching and listening. I am very pleased to be with you in my first public appearance as governor of the Bank of Canada. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended many of our ways of doing things, including speaking in person to large groups. Fortunately, we can take advantage of technology and I can speak to every Canadian club and Cercle Canadien and hear directly from your members right across the country. Thank you for the invitation. La COVID-19 est une tragédie humaine. Elle a provoqué un désastre économique sans précédent. Dans les secteurs entiers de l'économie, on était fermé. Déjà en avril, plus de 3 millions de personnes aient perdu leur emploi. Et 3,4 millions aient perdu plus de la moitié de leurs heures de travail. À cause de la pandémie, des millions de Canadiens sont dans une situation très difficile. Pour les décideurs économiques, c'est aussi une période difficile. Depuis une trentaine d'années, le Canada profite des bienfaits d'une politique monétaire basée sur des cibles d'inflation. Dans cette crise économique, la cible d'inflation était notre phare. Mais la faiblesse structurelle des taux d'intérêt et l'ampleur du choc de la pandémie changent notre façon d'appliquer notre cadre de politique monétaire. Before we get to the question and answer period, I want to talk about the essential ingredients of this framework and the ways the pandemic is affecting how we operate. I only have time to skim over some of these topics, so I'm hoping we can have a good discussion in the Q&A. Our monetary policy framework is design, designed to deliver low, stable, and predictable inflation. This is the best contribution we can make to Canada's economic welfare. That's because low, stable, and predictable inflation lays the foundation for sustainable economic growth. And keeping inflation near its target means the economy is running close to capacity with full employment. It's important to underline that our framework is set out in an agreement established with the government and renewed every five years. This sends an important signal that the democratically elected government and the bank agree on the policy goal. And it gives the bank the operational independence to pursue that goal. This enhances our credibility and give, gives Canadians more confidence that we will achieve the inflation target. And as I said, the inflation target is really a beacon to guide our policy. By grounding our actions in our framework, we will always be working toward bringing the economy near capacity with full employment. A successful inflation targeting monetary policy framework has a number of core ingredients. Clearly, we need to agree on a measure of inflation to target. We need to assess how much demand there is in the economy relative to its productive capacity or supply. We need tools to influ influence demand or spending and bring it in line with supply. And we also need an outlook for the economy because it takes time for our tools to affect spending and inflation. And because there are many unknowns, we need an understanding of the risk to the outlook. These are the basic ingredients of inflation targeting. And COVID-19, combined with structurally low interest rates globally, is affecting all of them. Commençons par notre mesure d'inflation. La banque cible le taux d'inflation de variation, le taux de variation sur 12 mois de l'indice des prix à la consommation, ou l'EPC. C'est la mesure la plus courante et la plus complète de l'inflation. Pour le taux d'inflation annuel, on vise 2 soit le point médian d'une for fourchette à 1 à 3 Mais deux, mais deux mois à l'autre, l'EPC est parfois très volatile et son évolution peut s'éloigner de la tendance à long terme. Pourquoi? Parce que les prix de certains produits, par exemple les prix des fruits et légumes frais ou de l'essence, peuvent varier énormément. Pour mieux voir les tendances derrière l'évolution de l'inflation, il faut donc examiner plusieurs mesures de l'inflation fondamentale. Total CPI is weighted to reflect the buying patterns of the average Canadian household. In normal times, for example, 
Canadians spend a lot more on gasoline than they do on alcohol, so gasoline has a larger weight in the index. But these aren't normal times. Because of the pandemic, Canadians are spending much less on gasoline and air travel and more on things like food purchases in stores. And until very recently, we weren't spending anything on haircuts. Fortunately, here in Ottawa, you can now get a haircut, and lucky for, for all of us, I got one last week. But more seriously, the implication is that the CPI isn't fully reflecting the current, people's current inflationary experience. Bank staff have been working with Statistics Canada to better understand the implications of these shifts in spending patterns. As the economy reopens, uh, many of these shifts are going to unwind. What we'll be doing is we'll be working to look through the temporary shifts while capturing the more enduring changes. The pandemic has also greatly complicated supply and demand. To see how, let's first consider the economy's capacity to produce goods and services. At the outset of the pandemic, Canadians were subject to necessary and strict containment measures to slow the spread of coronavirus. Physical distancing practices and stay-at-home orders quickly made sometimes some types of work impossible. Most non-essential workplaces were closed, putting a stop to many jobs that can't be done remotely. This resulted in a massive decline in supply. Maintenant que le déconfinement a commencé, on voit un retour partiel de l'offre. Mais avec le maintien de la distanciation physique, les entreprises ne sont pas peut-être pas aussi productives qu'avant. Et bien des services seront très difficiles à offrir. De plus, la réouverture de l'économie se fait à un rythme différent dans chaque région, secteur et pays. Cette, cette situation va bouleverser les chaînes d'approvisionnement et affecter le volume et les prix des exportations. Le coronavirus pourrait faire baisser l'immigration et donc limiter la croissance de la main dœuvre De manière plus généralisée, certains secteurs ne vont rouvrir re que s'il existe une vaccine ou au moins des antiviraux efficaces. Dans ces conditions, la capacité de production de l'économie va subir un choc dont les effets vont persister, même après le déconfinement. On the demand side, consider the millions of Canadians that have either lost their jobs or seen their hours scale back. This represents a very large drop in, the spend, in spending power across the country. Fortunately, the government, government's fiscal measures have been scaled to replace the labor income lost throughout the economy, laying the foundation for recovery. But spending has fallen sharply since the pandemic hit, and as Deputy Governor Larry Shembri pointed out in a speech last week, this is not only because there are fewer things to buy, but it's also because there's been a sharp drop in confidence. And until people are back at work and feel more confident, they're going to remain cautious in their spending. It's going to be crucial for us to understand how much supply and demand have been damaged and how they're going to recover in the coming quarters. As the economy reopens, we should see some very strong job growth numbers. We should also see pent-up demand giving a boost to spending. But not everyone's job is coming back, and an uncertainty will linger. As a result, we expect the quick rebound of the reopening phase of the recovery will give way, give way to a more gradual recuperation phase with weak demand. If, as we expect, supply is restored more quickly than demand, this could lead to a large gap between the two, putting a lot of downward pressure on inflation. Our main concern is to avoid a persistent drop in inflation by helping Canadians get back to work. Parlons des outils de politique monétaire. En temps normal, pour stimuler ou ralentir l'économie, la banque ajuste le taux de cible de financement à un jour. Ce taux interbancaire n'a généralement pas d'effet immédiat sur le consommateur, sauf s'ils ont un prêt hypothécaire 
à taux variable. Mais il se reflète dans les coûts empruntes à plus long terme, c'est-à-dire sur l'horizon qui touche la plupart des emprunteurs, que ce soit les particuliers ou les entreprises. Au début de la pandémie, il était clair que la confiance allait chuter. C'est pourquoi la banque a vite baissé le taux, taux, taux directeur à 25 points de base. L'objectif immédiat n'était pas vraiment de stimuler les dépenses, mais de soutenir la confiance. Et maintenant que les commerces commencent à rouvrir, les bas taux d'intérêt vont inciter les gens à dépenser. The policy rate is now at its effective lower bound of 25 basis points. Some central banks have taken policy rates below zero. We feel that bringing rates into negative, tory, negative territory could lead to distortions in the behavior of financial institutions. However, we have a number of other tools we can use to help stimulate demand. The bank has launched a series of purchase programs that involve buying different types of assets. We've launched programs to buy Canadian mortgage bonds, commercial paper, bankers, bankers acceptances, corporate bonds, and provincial and federal government debt. We introduced these programs to make sure that key markets were functioning properly and to keep credit flowing. Credit is the lifeblood of mar modern market-based economies. And during a crisis, it is imperative that central banks maintain access to credit and avoid a credit crunch. When markets aren't functioning properly, the ability for monetary policy to provide the stimulus to provide stimulus also breaks down. But financial markets are now working considerably better. And with this improvement, our asset purchase programs are becoming a source of monetary stimulus. The bank is committed to buying at least 5 billion of Canadian government bonds a week until the recovery is well underway. And these large scale asset purchases, they're building up. And as they build up, they deliver stimulus through a process that is often called quantitative easing, or QE. Here's how it works. Purchases of government bonds help lower yields. With funding markets now functioning properly, our weekly purchases also make borrowing cheaper for households and businesses. For example, as our purchases lower the yield on five-year government bonds, this is being reflected in cheaper fixed rate mortgages. QE can also send a signal that our policy interest rate is likely to remain low for a long period. By giving more certainty about the path of short-term interest rates, this can help lower long-term borrowing costs for both households and businesses. The bank is also buying private assets, including corporate bonds. We started these purchases of corporate bonds because of strains in the corporate bond market. To date, purchases have been, have been limited but market conditions have improved. This type of program provides stimulus by providing liquidity, helping narrow the difference between corporate and government bond yields. By reducing the premium corporations have to pay relative to governments, we're lowering interest rates for businesses. This is often called credit easing, or CE. At our last interest rate announcement on June 3rd, we indicated that with market functioning improved and containment restrictions easing, our focus is shifting to supporting output and employment. We also reiterated our commitment to continue large-scale asset purchases until the recovery is well underway. With market functioning restored, these purchases are working through more channels to deliver stimulus. Any further po policy actions would be calibrated to provide the necessary degree of monetary policy accommodation required to achieve the inflation target. The pandemic has created a fog of uncertainty, and this has greatly complicated our ability to generate a clear outlook for growth and inflation. The course of the coronavirus is the biggest source of uncertainty. Beyond that, we don't know how global trade and supply chains will evolve or what will happen with domestic supply and demand. We don't know how consumers, consumer and business confidence will rebound or whether the pandemic will lead to lasting changes in savings and spending habits. L'économie s'étant au moins stabilisée, 
on y voit un peu plus clair. L'arrivée des nouvelles données va nous donner certaines réponses. Dans le rapport sur la politique monétaire de juillet, on espère donc de fournir un scénario central pour l'évolution de la production et de l'inflation, avec une analyse aux principaux risques autour de ce scénario. On pourra ensuite évaluer les nouvelles informations par rapport à ce scénario. Currently, we expect growth to resume in the third quarter. The economy will get an immediate boost as containment measures are lifted, people are called back to work, and households resume some of their normal activities. But it'll be important not to assume that these growth rates will continue beyond the reopening phase. The pandemic is likely to inflict some lasting damage to demand and supply. The recovery will likely be prolonged and bumpy with potential setbacks along the way. The message I want to leave you with is that while we're using different tools in these extraordinary times, our policy remains grounded in the same framework. The inflation target is our beacon that's guiding our actions that will help bring the economy from crisis through reopening to recuperation and recovery. And with that, let me stop and open the floor to your questions. I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much for your remarks, Governor. As we move to the Q&A, I would like to introduce the president of the Montreal uh, Canadian Club's board of directors, Madame Marie-Hélène Nollet. Bonjour and everyone. I'm uh, very happy to participate to this event today. Also with us is the president of the Canadian Club Toronto, Bruce Sellery. He's going to kick off the armchair uh, discussion portion of this event. So over to you, Bruce. Thank you very much. And Governor, I'm so glad to see that we kitted you out with a proper armchair. Uh, as a traditional Canadian club event, regardless of where you attended across this country over the past, what, 100, 120 years, would include a casual and intimate conversation as our clubs have been for so long interviewing policymakers such as yourself, presidents, prime ministers. And so we want to begin with something that will give us an insight to you as a person. We're going to be listening to your economic forecast for probably something like the next seven years or so. And we know that you're going to be looking at the same economic indicators as your predecessors. But what would you say informs your world that has you be your, your own unique human doing a very challenging and uh, important job for our country? Well, well, thank you again for having me, and it is, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, I don't really like talking about myself. You sure you don't want my uh, detailed explanation of quantitative easing? Um, what, what? Moment, uh, but yes, we do want a little bit about you. You've got a big job. You've got a lot of power. We don't need to know uh, more about you than just the fact that you have a fancy new haircut, which looks great, by the way. Thank you. Uh, okay, so what, what, what informs my views? Um, It's very important to get a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of backgrounds, um, a diversity of, of views. Uh, it's going to be really important uh, that we, we have the debate, we have the discussion, uh, and we, we try to drive to a consensus. Uh, you know, when, I, when I speak as governor, uh, it's going to be grounded in a lot of hard work and analysis by the staff here at the Bank of Canada. Uh, it's going to reflect Uh, the vibrant discussion around the, the governing council table. Uh, you know, those are the things that are really going to inform me. So another one. In what ways are you different than power governors in style and substance? Um, well, I, I would begin by saying um, I, I wouldn't over-personalize it. Um, <clears throat> As I said, I'm, I'm going to speak reflecting uh, the analysis of the Bank of Canada and the discussion. Um, I think both you know, Governor Polos and, and uh, Senior Deputy Carolyn Wilkins have you know, created a, a leading central bank, and you know, I'm very pleased to build on that. Um, and uh, you know, again, I, I'm going to be looking for a diversity of views going forward. Uh, I think it's going to be very important that the Bank of Canada 
really understands and responds to the major forces on the Canadian economy. Uh, it's going to be very important that we're accountable can to Canadians. Uh, and it's very important that we're going to be ready for the unexpected. You mentioned the CPI and the importance of looking at what's in that basket of goods, given how people's spending habits have changed so dramatically. As you look ahead, where do you see spending reverting very quickly, fairly quickly? And where, what categories of spending do you see either taking just a little bit longer or whether there could be a permanent change? Um, yes, I mean, as you indicated, um, we, you know, we, we are seeing changes in spending patterns. Uh, in fact, we've, we've been uh, working with Statistics Canada on, on looking at how uh, changing spending patterns are affecting the measurement of inflation. Uh, you know, looking forward, I think, uh, as the economy reopens, uh, we are going to see um, some of those shifts unwind. Uh, you know, we're, we're all dying for a haircut. Uh, there are a number of things that you're going to see come back pretty quickly. There are other things, though, that um, activities that involve large numbers of people that aren't going to come back for some time. We, none of us are going to a rock concert a anytime soon. Uh, hospitality, in-person entertainment, air travel, uh, those activities are, are likely to be slower uh, to come back. Um, there may also be some, some permanent shifts in spend patterns. Um, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, um, you know, what we're going to be working on is try to look through the temporary shifts, uh, but um, embrace and uh, adapt to the, the more permanent shifts. You know, it's probably too early to get a really good feel on what those permanent shifts are. Um, you know, just to give you one example, uh, you know, when Apple introduced the iPhone in 2007, you know, there, there were a number of pretty predictable effects. You know, we were going to do more banking and entertainment on our phones, but I don't think anybody saw Uber coming or, or Airbnb coming. Uh, you know, we're right. We're, we're just starting the recovery. Uh, we're only a few months into this. Uh, there will be some unanticipated longer-term effects. Uh, you know, our job at the Bank of Canada is going to be making sure we understand and adapt to those. La semaine dernière, vous avez dit devant le comité des finances à la Chambre des communes que vous n'aviez pas l'intention d'augmenter le taux d'intérêt compte tenu de la situation actuelle. Dans quelles circonstances pourriez-vous envisager les augmenter, même avec un taux de chômage supérieur à 8 ou 10 uh, <coughs> Comme je viens de juste mentionner, nous sommes au début du reprise. Uh, au premier trimestre, le uh, PIB a diminué à peu près 2 uh, au deuxième trimestre, c'est chuté. Uh, le niveau uh, est, est très bas. Uh, la reprise uh, sera longue. Uh, on anticipe une reprise uh, à au moins deux phases. Une un, un phase de réouvrir, uh, où on peut voir des, des taux de croissance assez forts. Après une, une phase uh, plus longue, plus, plus graduelle, uh, une phase qu'on s'appelle une phase de récup récupération. La reprise, uh, c'est l'entière de ces deux phases. Donc, ce sera, et ce sera important de, de donner le support uh, du stimulus monétaire durant cette uh, période. Donc, euh, ce sera une, une période assez longue avant qu'on euh, commence les discussions autour euh, du, euh, de euh, euh, retirer euh, le stimulus. Euh, nous avons tous les outils que nous avons besoin euh, quand euh, c'est le temps, mais euh, ce n'est pas une discussion que nous sommes en train d'engager maintenant. The pandemic has not affected all Canadians equally. In fact, those in lower paying service oriented jobs have really borne the brunt of the pain, especially if they are trying to parent at the same time. My 10 year old is locked away in a nearby room. We, we, we still uh, have some empathy for those Canadians who are trying to juggle so many different balls. What would you say the bank needs to do differently for these different segments of the population? Because low interest rates don't help the renter in the same way as they do a homeowner, for example? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, in recessions, it is typically the most vulnerable, vulnerable members of society uh, that, that suffer the most. Uh, this 
recession, it's a deep one, and it's certainly no exception. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things, as you alluded to, that we're seeing in this recession is that um, women uh, are particularly affected for two reasons. One, typically in recession, services uh, are not as affected as much as, as, as manufacturing or construction. Uh, in this recession, though, because many services involve uh, close physical proximity to people, uh, they are particularly affected and women work disproportionately in the service industry. The other reason uh, women are disproportionately affected is that women still uh, do the largest part of, of child care and elder care uh, and you know, schools are closed, summer camps are closed, uh, many, you know, most activities are closed, daycares are, are closed uh, in most parts of the country. Uh, and so, you know, women are dealing with children at home, not, so, uh, you know, they may not be able to work. Uh, and I think an important message to employers is they're going to need to be flexible. Uh, from the, you know, for monetary policy, um, you know, we, we can't target individual segments of society, but, you know, the best thing we can do is, is focus on supporting the recovery uh, keeping interest rates across the yield curve uh, low so that households and businesses have access to credit at low interest rates. Uh, and that should you know, help Canadians get back to work. You know, the best thing you know, we can do is, is, is support the recovery. That's going to help uh, all segments of society. Um, you know, I, I would also say you know, it's not just women. If you look at the latest labor force uh, numbers, uh, youth have been particularly affected. Uh, recent immigrants have been particularly affected, uh, and uh, fiscal policy has been a very, you know, it is the tool that targets, can, can target different groups, and there have been a series of um, extraordinary uh, fiscal support programs that are uh, helping these various groups and laying the foundation for recovery. So Canada is a great, vast, and complicated country. How do you, as a governor, balance the different needs of different industries? Let's use example oil and gas as an example. Uh, it is a vast country. It's a beautiful country. Uh, and we have a, a remarkably diverse economy. That's an asset. We've got a large service sector. We've got an important resource sector and a significant manufacturing sector. Um, you know, at any one time, you know, different sectors will be growing at, at different speeds. For certainly, for uh, people in our uh, oil-producing regions, you know, b before the pandemic hit, uh, Canada was in a, in a very good place. Uh, unemployment was at a 40-year low. Inflation was very close to target. Um, but even then, the, the you know, the, it wasn't evenly spread across the country. Our oil-producer regions. Uh, were not as strong as the rest of the country. Uh, now, unfortunately, they're facing a double whammy. Uh, the coronavirus uh, and the, the, the effects that's had on the, their economy uh, and uh, a large oil price shock. Fortunately, oil prices, uh, having gone virtually to zero, uh, have now uh, worked their way quite a bit back. Uh, this morning, WTI is almost $40. Um, but there's no doubt that the pandemic uh, is going to have uh, an ongoing effect on oil prices. And in fact, the weakness in oil prices could, could last longer than the pandemic. Um, you know, from monetary policy perspective, uh, again, you know, we, can't, we can't target different industries or different regions, uh, but it's very important that we understand uh, what's going on across this vast country. Uh, we understand the, the experience of Canadians in all the regions, uh, and that we take that into account as we uh, design and implement uh, our monetary policies. The United States faces many uncertainties, many uncertainties. The questions around the fall election, their own fight against COVID-19, their approach on uh, post-pandemic reopening, all that stuff. And of course, the U.S. outlook is an enormous risk for us. How will the Bank of Canada navigate that under your leadership? Well, as you've indicated, uh, the Canadian and U.S. economies are closely linked. Uh, what happens in the U.S. economy uh, will have an important impact on Canada. Um, 
as you indicated, there, there is a lot going on in the U.S. Uh, I mean, there's, there's uncertainty around the course of coronavirus itself. Uh, unfortunately, we are seeing uh, rising cases in, in a number of parts of the United States. Uh, there's the economy. Uh, how are households, how are consumers going to respond? How are businesses going to respond? Uh, there's social unrest. Uh, there's, there's an election cycle coming. Um, I don't have any you know, searing insights to offer you on, on each one of those, uh, but what I can tell you is that you know, we will be assessing uh, the, the strength of the U.S. recovery. We'll be assessing the evolution of the U.S. recovery very carefully going forward. We will uh, factor that in, and we will be factoring that into our analysis. Clearly, uh, you know, a stronger U.S. recovery would be good for Canada. So la dette des ménages canadiens est une préoccupation importante pour la Banque du Canada. Selon vous, comment voyez-vous l'endettement actuel des ménages affecter la reprise économique, considérant que l'économie américaine, les consommateurs se sont désendettés énormément au cours des 12 dernières années? L'endettement des, des ménages au Canada, comme la Banque a souligné plusieurs fois, est, est un risque, c'est élevé au Canada. Qu'est-ce qu'on voit à ce moment, c'est que euh, avec les, euh, les programmes de transfert fiscaux aux ménages, euh, ces programmes ont, euh, à peu près, sont à peu près, euh, ont à peu près euh, compensé pour la réduction en revenus que les ménages ont euh, à cause du crise. Et... Euh, les ménages ont réduit les dépenses parce qu'il y a moins à acheter et aussi ils ont l'incertitude autour de leur job. Euh, et donc, pour ces deux raisons, qu'est-ce qu'on voit maintenant? C'est le taux d'épargne à augmenter. Euh, plusieurs ménages euh, sont en train de réduire leur dette et dont le, le taux de croissance du crédit des ménages a beaucoup diminué. Euh, donc, euh, ça, ça crée une, une fondation euh, pour une reprise. Et durant cette reprise, c'est clair que le rôle du Banque, Banque du Canada sera de, de donner le stimulus nécessaire pour supporter cette reprise, euh, pour encourager les, les, euh, les euh, ménages de, de dépenser. Euh, mais ce serait important que... Euh, les ménages avec des très hautes dettes ne sont pas les ménages qui prennent plus de dettes. Euh, et euh, avec euh, des mesures macro-prudentielles, euh, le gouvernement et différentes agences du gouvernement ont mis quelques euh, politiques en place pour limiter que les ménages avec les plus hautes dettes sont les ménages qui euh, dépensent encore plus. Donc, euh, ça serait important... Euh, durant cette reprise, de, de ne, pas, euh, ne pas exacerber ces, euh, ces risques. I want to ask you about economic indicators. You referenced in your opening remarks that there will be setbacks. Of course, there will be setbacks. How will you be able to tell what is the equivalent of a flat tire versus what is actually a blown piston when it comes to the Canadian economy? Um, okay, I get my uh, car metaphors out. Um, <laughs> you're, you know, you're right that uh, we are in a situation of unprecedented uncertainty. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we don't know. I mean, the biggest thing we don't know uh, is the course of the coronavirus itself. Um, we also don't know uh, how much damage there is uh, to the economy. What we do know is that typically very deep recessions, and we have a very deep recession, cause more lasting damage. And you know, what we're expecting is, as the economy uh, reopens, as the containment uh, restrictions are being lifted, we'll probably see a pretty good bounce. We're probably going to see some pretty good uh, job growth numbers, um, some pretty good growth in GDP uh, through the third quarter. Uh, after we get through that initial period, that reopening period, that's probably when we're going to start to get a sense of how much damage there really is. You know, how much, you know, is it just a flat tire or, um, you know, is the transmission busted uh, and it's going to be a bigger repair job? Uh, 
when we think of the recovery, we think of it including both this reopening phase and this slower, more gradual uh, recuperation phase where you know, we've got to repair the car. Uh, and it's going to be important for monetary policy to provide the support that the economy needs uh, through both stages. Vous avez présidé le groupe d'experts sur la finance durable dont le rapport a été déposé l'année dernière. Pouvez-vous nous donner un ou deux exemples spécifiques de la manière dont vous comptez intégrer ces idées dans le travail de la Banque du Canada? Et y aura-t-il des, des obstacles à l'implantation selon vous? C'est clair que le, le changement du climat euh, avance de plus en plus vite et toutes les institutions devront accélérer en leur travail euh, sur ce sujet et euh, ça, ça inclut la, la Banque du Canada. Euh, quelques exemples. Euh, un exemple, c'est de, de faire des scénarios. Uh, que sont les scénarios pour l'économie canadienne uh, autour de la transition uh, d'une um, croissance plus verte? Que sont les, les scénarios uh, pour uh, le secteur financier quand, les, quand il y a des changements des prix des actifs uh, à, à cause du uh, changement climatique? Uh, que sont les scénarios pour uh, le secteur financier? Ce sera très important pour nous à la banque de comprendre euh, les effets du climat, changement climatique sur l'économie canadienne. Et ce sera très important pour aussi le secteur privé de comprendre. Parce que vraiment, c'est le secteur privé qui vraiment devrait ajuster. C'est eux qui créent le, les émissions et c'est eux qui devraient euh, ajuster. Et ces scénarios pour aider uh, on ce processus. I want to ask you about what is happening for Canada's chartered banks right now, because certainly there is anecdotal evidence that they are being more conservative in, in their lending. What would you say are the mechanisms through which the Bank of Canada can, can ensure that the commercial banks are lending behind, beyond just these rock bottom interest rates? Uh, that's been a, a very important focus of the Bank of Canada's policy. Um, you know, if you go back to March and April, <clears throat> uh, with you know the sudden uh, arrival of the coronavirus and and a you know, dramatic pivot in people's ec economic expectations, uh, we saw severe strains of freezing in a number of core credit markets, and that's why <clears throat> the Bank of Canada came in with a with a number of purchase programs. Uh, to provide the liquidity that the system needed to keep credit flowing. So what you're seeing, you know, banks uh, through this crisis, unlike the last crisis when they were the problem, this crisis, they're a big part of the solution. Banks are an important shock absorber. They're deferring mortgages for households. They're uh, providing businesses uh, loans to bridge them to the other side of it. But in order to do that, they have to be able to fund those loans. And, and a critical function of the central bank uh, is to make sure that the system has the liquidity so that the banking system can get access to funding so that they can, uh, they can, they can do that. Um, and you know, the good news is that uh, with these programs um, and, and uh, I think you know, the economy having stabilized, we are seeing much improved uh, conditions uh, in financial markets. Um, you know, some of our shorter-term programs, uh, we are now uh, scaling back as markets normalize. Um, and you know, to bring it back to, to monetary policy, with that normalization, uh, the stimulus that we're providing, the monetary stimulus that we're providing to the system is starting to flow through more channels uh, and support the recovery. You were in force during the last crisis in 2008. En quoi, selon vous, la relance sera-t-elle différente cette fois-ci? Uh, comme j'ai mentionné, les, les différences très importantes en ces, ces crises. Uh, en 2008, c'était une crise financière. C'était les, 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 les banques, les, les institutions financières, surtout aux États-Unis, en Europe, qui c'était le problème. Uh, et uh, le résultat, c'est une contraction très forte du crédit 
et, et l'effet, c'était une, une, une récession très sérieuse. Cette fois-ci, ce n'est pas les, les euh, insuffisances financières qui sont le problème. Euh, C'est une crise euh, de santé, une crise, c'est euh, medical crisis. Euh, <coughs> et comme j'ai mentionné, le secteur financier euh, est une partie de la solution. Uh, the, sec the financial sector can be an important shock absorber, helping uh, households and businesses get to the other side of this. Uh, having said that, um, there are certain lessons um, that you know, crises have in common. Uh, I have something I call the, the seven C's of, of crisis leadership, and I'm not going to go through all seven, but you know, I'll just give you a couple. Uh, you know, the first is contingency planning. Um, It's better if it starts well before a crisis, but even once a crisis starts, you often have a bit of a recovery window. Um, it's really important that you use that period to plan for what else could go wrong and make sure you've got fully executable plans to address it. The second principle is, is what I call crush it. Um, when you've got a real crisis, you need to step beyond the normal responses and really embrace the idea that you need to overwhelm this crisis. And I, I think in, in, in Canada, uh, you know, both the government and the Bank of Canada uh, have really embraced that, um, rolling out you know, unprecedented, uh, extraordinary programs uh, to build a bridge, uh, to put a floor under this crisis and help Canadians uh, get through it. Um, you know, another element I would highlight is the importance of, of cooperation and, and communication. Um, monetary policy is playing a very important complementary role to fiscal policy. Monetary and fiscal policy together with uh, OSFI and other agencies are working closely together within their mandates to support the recovery. Um, we also need international cooperation and, and, and we could use a little more international cooperation going forward. I think the hashtag is going to be uh, hashtag crush it, Governor, and there may be t-shirts, so we'll, we'll watch on that front. Uh, we're getting a whole bunch of great questions from our audience today, and I want to include one on real estate. And it's kind of a follow-on to your comments on household debt, but this is a massive, massive uh, asset on the net worth statements for so many Canadians across this country. How much risk does that represent? Uh, <clears throat> well, real estate has, has a lot of different parts to it. There's, you know, there's, there's houses, there's commercial real estate, there's, uh, there's warehouses. Uh, you know, so far, what I can tell you is we're seeing uh, quite differential effects. Um, so, for example, um, warehouses, um, we're seeing uh, quite strong demand. There's, we're, you know, we're all shopping, we're all using e-commerce more, uh, so those... Um, Fulfillment centers, uh, those warehouses, uh, there's strong demand for those. Uh, you know, commercial real estate, uh, clearly uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think you know, we're all looking forward to getting back to work, but work's probably going to look different. Uh, and you know, what is that going to look like? Uh, parts of the retail sector are being particularly uh, affected, uh, malls, for example. Um, and with respect to housing, um, you know, we, we've seen... Uh, Not surprisingly, with the containment uh, restrictions, you know, sharp drops in in, in activity. Uh, but so far, um, we haven't, you know, how, housing prices have have been uh, relatively stable. Um, you know, we will certainly be watching very closely and you know, feeding all that into our assessment of the recovery. Um, I do expect that different parts of the real estate market will be affected uh, quite differently going forward. Uh, so it's going to be under, uh, important to understand that. Another great question is, beyond recovery from COVID-19, what is your longer-term vision for the Bank of Canada? Where will be the bank in seven years from now? Uh, well, as a new governor, I, I, I'm very conscious that uh, I am the steward of the, of the Bank of Canada. And uh, like the governors that have come before me, um, I want to leave it in better shape than, than I found it. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, under Governor Polas and, and Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins, um, you know, they built the Bank of Canada into a leading central bank, so I'm starting from a very good place. Uh, you know, as, as I look forward, uh, what I am really struck by is 
the pace of change is accelerating. Uh, you know, markets are accelerating, the pace of technological change is accelerating, uh, climate change is accelerating. And to be frank, societies around the world are having trouble keeping up with this a rate of this faster rate of change. Uh, for a central bank, it's going to be very important that we keep up, that we actually get ahead of it, uh, that we uh, that <clears throat> you know we really understand uh, the major forces on the Canadian economy. Uh, we respond to them. Uh, we're accountable to Canadians, <clears throat> uh, and we're prepared uh, for the unknowns. I think it's going to be very important that. We're flexible in the application of our policies. We're agile, uh, we're innovative, uh, and we're resolute. Uh, and the other element uh, is uh, we're going to need to be more diverse and more inclusive uh, in, in every dimension, uh, both inside and outside the bank. I want to ask you about uh, the potential for a second wave of the coronavirus. We're starting to see that in some parts of the country. Uh, it is very difficult to put the genie back in the bottle, and Canadians have now experienced some freedom in certain geographies. How do you factor in the risk of a second wave into your forecasts? Uh, the, the, the outlook is fraught with uncertainty, and the biggest one is the course of the coronavirus. Uh, I think you know, the key here is there are going to be outbreaks as the economy reopens. We're seeing this around the world. The key is going to be responding quickly and trying to contain those. What does that mean? It means you know, we're going to need good uh, contract, contact tracing. Uh, we're going to need a lot of testing. Uh, and you know, the hope is that we've learned a lot and we can do a much better job of uh, shutting down things in, in much more locally. Um, if we can't do that, you're right. We're going to have to get back to broad-based containment, uh, and that will be a very large setback. Um, you know, companies need to be, uh, you know, they need, we're going to need to use all our ingenuity in how to get people back to work safely how to serve customers safely uh, so we minimize the probability of uh, a second wave and, and respreading of the virus. And when that does occur, uh, we're going to have to respond quickly and in a targeted manner to really try to prevent its spread. I will say last question to Marie-Hélène. We're almost at our time. Governor, we only have a few minutes left. Bruce and I would like to give you the last word. It could be something we didn't touch on, a call to action, or simply hope. So what would be your last word? <clears throat> My last word is um, we're going to get through this. Uh, Canadians are resourceful. Our business community has uh, got lots of ingenuity. And I think policymakers are being innovative, and they are resolute. Uh, but it's going to be a long slow recovery. There are going to be setbacks. We're, we have seen a precipitous drop in economic activity. Uh, and you know, while I, we're, we're expecting, uh, we're optimistic that there'll be a good rebound, we've, we've avoided uh, the worst scenario. Uh, not all jobs are coming back. Uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, and you know, my commitment as governor of the Bank of Canada is that we are laser focused on supporting this recovery. Uh, and you know, the inflation target is our beacon. We're going to be um, guiding policy to keep inflation uh, on target. And to do that, uh, we need to support the recovery and get Canadians back to work. Thank you. Governor, I would like to thank you for your remarks and for taking the time to answer so many good questions. I wish you the very best in your new position. So the first question is from Kevin Gallagher of CTV. Uh, he'll be followed by Kim McRail and Dave Parkinson. Go ahead, Kevin. Good morning, Governor. Kevin Gallagher here. Um, 
The government is going to put out uh, what is a partial snapshot of Canada's economic situation in uh, this partial economic update. Um, but uh, how much uh, of the lack of information and uncertainty makes it difficult to have real projections uh, for you to do your work in managing the economy? How much of that is tied to the Canadian government being able to put forward things like a full fiscal update and a full federal budget? Thank you. Um, look, uh, the outlook is fraught with uncertainty. I don't think I need to underline that too many times. Um, with respect to um, what we're planning to do on July 15th in our uh, monetary policy report, uh, as I've indicated, uh, we will be uh, publishing a central scenario. And, and just to tell you what we mean by a central scenario, uh, a central scenario is going to look a lot like a forecast, uh, but reflecting the fact that there are there is unprecedented levels of uncertainty, um, particularly around the evolution of the virus itself, uh, we're, we're calling it a, a central scenario to really underline uh, that there is an unusual amount of uncertainty around it. Um, you know, with respect to the government's update, uh, that will certainly be helpful. Uh, the government has already been very transparent on um, its, its spending uh, with respect to the various emergency uh, response measures it's taken to support households, to support businesses, to uh, defer uh, tax collections, to, to provide lending. Um, and certainly those those spending plans will be an important input into our outlook. Next question is from Just Kim. Just follow up. Uh, sorry, Kevin, we're, we don't have time for follow up. If we have time, we'll come back to you. I've got to move on to okay. Kim, Kim McRail of Wall Street Journal is next. Hi, thank you, Governor. Uh, you referred in this speech to the bank's asset purchase programs as becoming a source of monetary stimulus. Can you talk about when those shifted from be, from easing strains in financial markets to providing stimulus and how effective is quantitative easing in providing stimulus to the economy right now? So the, the, the asset purchase programs uh, were launched in a period when there were severe strains in funding markets and their uh, immediate uh, goal uh, you know, the imperative of central bank is to provide the liquidity uh, that is needed to keep credit flowing. Uh, in you know, and that was really through uh, March and April. Uh, as we've seen, you know, as we've got into May and, and certainly now into June, uh, we have seen uh, a substantial improvement in in market functioning. Uh, that. So some of our shorter term programs, uh, BA program, for example, uh, you're seeing uh, a scale back that program. Uh, the repos uh, are, are starting to roll off. Uh, at the same time, um, we have committed to continue buying Government of Canada bonds at a pace of at least $5 billion a week. Uh, and particularly with the uh, with the improvements we've seen in funding markets, and with the economy beginning to reopen, um, that will be an important source of, of stimulus. Uh, that is that is quantitative easing. That'll be an important so source of stimulus. We've lowered the policy rate to the effective lower bound of 25 basis points at the short end, and uh, the large scale asset purchases are. Um, contributing to keeping interest rates low across the Government of Canada curve, uh, and that is getting passed on to households and businesses. There is a considerable amount of monetary stimulus uh, in place. If you look at, if you look at uh, you know, more five-year variable rate mortgages down about 80 basis points, prime rate down about 150 basis points, uh, rates across the government curve are at or very near historic lows. And if you look at you know, real interest rates, by which I mean the, the nominal rate less expected inflation, uh, those are negative across the entire curve. Thank you. The next question is from Dave Parkinson, and he'll be followed by Shelley Hagen of Bloomberg and Kelsey Johnson of Reuters. Uh, good, oh, sorry, good afternoon, Governor. Um, 
turned into afternoon while I was working. Um, just wanted to um, follow up on Kim's question a little bit. Um, uh, when you talk about those uh, QE and CE functions of those uh, bond programs, um, you know, shifting to uh, more of a monetary stimulus role, I'm wondering if, if uh, you foresee that the bank will have to adjust those programs, rework them in some way to, to more specifically serve a monetary stimulus purpose as opposed to their initial uh, market functioning purpose, if, if, if we are going to need to see a reworking, even an expansion of those programs in order to, to serve that, uh, that new role more directly? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I think what I would stress is that uh, while these programs were initiated to uh, restore mon market functioning, uh, as that has uh, progressed and, and has, has, as that market functioning has been restored, uh, increasingly, particularly the large-scale asset purchases, uh, are providing monetary stimulus. We, you know, we have, uh, we certainly have options going forward. Uh, we can scale those programs. Um, you know, we've seen uh, central banks around the world uh, try other things, yield curve control, forward guidance. Uh, these things are all in our toolkit. Uh, what I can tell you is that you know, going forward, um, the, you know, the types of measures we take will depend on the circumstances. Different measures have different effectiveness uh, in different circumstances. Uh, and they will be guided uh, by the achievement of our inflation target. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be flexible. Uh, we'll be resolute, uh, we're going to be innovative, and we're going to be determined. Thank you. Just before we go to the next question, for those reporters who are late in joining the call, if you have a question, let us know by sending an email to communications at bankofcanada.ca, and we'll put you in the queue. Pour les journalistes qui se sont joints à l'appel avec un peu de... For journalists who are joining the call late, please send a short email to the email address specified. If you wish to ask a question, and your name will be added to the list. From Shelley. Hi, Governor. This is Shelley Hagen with Bloomberg News. Hi, Shelley. When the time does come to remove emergency stimulus, do you anticipate you'll reduce your balance sheet first before raising rates? Um, look, we, we have all the tools we need to exit, uh, but exit is a long way off. Um, we're at the very beginning of recovery from an unprecedented drop in GDP. Uh, we expect a, a you know, in the immediate coming months, we do expect to see some pretty good uh, growth numbers, both jobs and, and GDP. Uh, but we do expect that, you know, following this uh, initial reopening phase, uh, there will be a slower, longer recuperation phase. Uh, and you know, I call it recuperation because there's, there's a healing. Um, there's going to be a certain amount of damage in the economy, uh, and it's going to be in support, important that monetary policy support and nurture the recovery uh, through this uh, recuperation phase. Um, we think of the recovery as including both those phases, uh, so it is a considerable period of time. Uh, you know, someday, uh, yes, uh, we will be having that discussion about exit, uh, and I look forward to that discussion, but uh, it, it's some ways off. The next question is from Kelsey Johnson of Reuters, followed by Greg Quinn of Market News and Kevin Carmichael of the Financial Post. Uh, thank you, Governor, for taking my question. It's Kelsey Johnson from Reuters. But following on that last comment you made, you've, you've said that we're in for a long, bumpy ride, that it's going to be a considerable amount of time till exit. Do you, are we talking a year, two years, in terms of the length of this recuperation phase? Do you have a more specific timeline? Uh, I, I'm not going to put it on a calendar for you. Uh, as I said, um, you know, we, we expect this to, to evolve in at least two phases. Uh, we will be putting out uh, 
our monetary policy report on July 15th. That will uh, provide a scenario, and as I said, um, you know, it'll be a central scenario. In many respects, it'll look a lot like a forecast, uh, but we're calling it a scenario to underline the, the high degree of uncertainty around it. Um, that'll lay down a track. Um, we will be monitoring incoming information you know, relative to that track going forward, uh, and we'll be, we'll be updating, updating uh, our, our outlook going forward. Uh, you know, that process, uh, you know, it's going to take some time as we get through uh, this reopening phase and get into the recuperation phase uh, just to see how long it's going to take. The next question is from Greg, um, and after him will be Kevin and then Tony Mace of Mace News. Go ahead, Greg. Hello. Um, you, you mentioned, as, as well as the pandemic, kind of domestically focused shocks from low oil prices and household debt. Um, when it comes, how, how do you view those two economic comebacks from the oil and housing versus from COVID-19? Are they sort of from the same ball of wax, if you will, when it comes to looking at what kind of uh, policy measures you might be taking? Uh, well, Kevin, I mean, clearly they're all, or sorry, it's Greg, uh, Greg, sorry. Uh, clearly they're, they're all interrelated. Um, you, you, you talk of housing, um, you know, the quicker people uh, get back to work, the quicker people have confidence that their jobs are secure, there's jobs for them to go back to, um, the quicker their confidence will be restored and the more likely they are to make a major purchase like a house or a car. Um, you know, with respect to oil prices, um, COVID's a big part of it. It's not, it's not the whole part of it, uh, but clearly um, you know, as the global economy recovers, uh, the demand for oil uh, will come back. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, some parts, you know, I think it's reasonable to expect airlines are going to take longer to come back than uh, some other parts of the economy. So it may take time, you know, their emergency source of oil demand, it may take time for that oil demand uh, to recover. And certainly, uh, low oil prices may, may last longer than the virus itself. Uh, there are obviously, in the case of oil, um, a certain amount of geopolitical discussions uh, among the, the OPEC group. It's hard to predict uh, how those would play out. Um, you know, certainly for, for Canada, uh, it is, it is, it's a double whammy. Uh, we've, we're facing a massive shock related to COVID. Uh, lower oil prices are, are particularly affecting our oil producing regions, but low, low, lower oil prices affect everyone in Canada. Uh, oil is our biggest export, uh, and if we're exporting less and we're exporting at lower prices, there's less money coming into the country. The next question is from Kevin Carmichael. Kevin, you may be on mute. Hey, you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, Governor, uh, could you go into more detail about how you'll be monitoring inflation uh, going forward, given uh, your uncertainty around whether behavioral changes are affecting what you're seeing in the CPI? So we've known for some time that uh, people's perceptions of inflation uh, can differ from measured inflation. And um, that appears to be related to the fact that, that people's perceptions about inflation are heavily affected by frequently purchased items, things like food, the grocery store. Um, large purchases like cars, for example, which happen less frequently, um, even though they're a substantial amount of your overall family budget, uh, tend to have a smaller effect on your perceptions of inflation. Uh, we have been doing some surveys, and what, what we see uh, now is, not too surprisingly, uh, given the, the big shifts we're seeing in household spending patterns, um, people's perceptions of inflation and measured inflation uh, are differing more than usual. Um, I mean, total CPI inflation is, is around zero. Uh, perceptions are, are quite a bit above that. We've also been doing some work 
with Can with Statistics Canada uh, to examine you know what would inflation be if we uh, shifted the weights in the index to be more reflective of uh, the buying patterns of Canadians right now. And what you see when you do that is that um, inflation uh, measured inflation. Um, hasn't fallen quite as much as total CPI, although there's not a huge gap uh, between them. Um, you know, what, I, what I would say going forward is that uh, some of the shifts we've seen in spending patterns are going to unwind as we get back to more regular shopping activities. Uh, there'll probably be some effects that are uh, more persistent. I mean, clearly, um, you know, uh, spending on... Uh, you know, and you know, going to you know large entertainment events with thousands of people—that's not happening anytime soon. So, you know, some of these effects will be more persistent. Um, our, you know, the work that we're doing here, uh, aided by StatsCan, will really try to look through these more temporary effects that are going to unwind and factor in uh, the more enduring effects. I think we can squeeze in the two last questions. First by Tony Mace of Mace News, followed by Jordan Press of Canadian Press. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, Governor. It's Tony Mace from Mace News. Thanks for taking my question. You, you mentioned that the upcoming monetary policy report would include a central scenario. Um, I'm wondering what kind of assumptions about COVID that scenario might incorporate or what other kinds of scenarios that the bank is considering. I mean, you mentioned um, in managing COVID that it's important to, or the hope is that any outbreaks be managed on a local basis as opposed to national shutdowns. I'm just wondering how you think about that in terms of the various scenarios. Um, so I haven't you know, seen the, the forecast yet that the staff is presenting. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. There's a there's a process between now and uh, July 15th. But I think at a high level, uh, it's probably safe to say that um, you know, the central scenario is not going to include a you know major a second major economy wide um, shutdown. Uh, there will be risks around that central scenario, and and that would be one of them. Um, the I think the central scenario, though, would embody uh, the reality that there probably will be some more local flare-ups, and so um, you know, that that will be affecting supply uh, on an ongoing basis. As I said before, hopefully, uh, with each flare-up, we get better uh, at at targeting it, isolating it, and uh, closing it down faster than the one before. Um, Thank you. The last question is from Jordan. Oh, hi. Good morning. Or sorry, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I just wanted to ask, you talked in your speech about that this pandemic is likely to inflict some lasting damage to demand and supply. And I'm just curious if you can maybe talk a bit about some of the early indications that you're seeing about that lasting damage so Canadians can understand what you mean by that. Um, <clears throat> actually, right now, it, it, it's, it's pretty hard to see it uh, because... Um, uh, the government has has um, provided uh, very large scale transfers to households, supports for business, uh, CERB, the wage subsidy, uh, and they have for, you know for households those transfers are replacing the income they've lost uh, from COVID. Uh, as we get through, uh, you know, and, and even in this next first reopening phase. Uh, I said, I think you're going to see some, some pretty good job growth numbers. You're going to see some good uh, GDP growth numbers uh, as supply comes back online. As we get through that uh, reopening phase, though, um, we do think that the pace of the recovery will slow. Uh, and that will reflect um, the reality that you know, not everybody's job is coming back. Uh, it'll reflect the fact that you know, some companies aren't going to make it to the other side of this. Uh, new companies will form. Uh, existing companies will seize new opportunities. Uh, but that takes some time. And through that, you know, that's going to be a slower, a bumpier process uh, that is going to require ongoing support. 
And that concludes today's press conference. Thank you very much, Governor, and thanks for everybody for joining us. Thank you.